All right, great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Hanlin Tang. Um, I lead an engineering team in Intel's AI product group that principally focuses on building computer vision algorithms and then applying them for enterprise. And I joined Intel about a year ago from its acquisition of the deep learning startup Nirvana Systems. What I prepared for today is a little bit about what we've done, um, a lot about what we've learned along the way, which we think is relevant for any enterprise that wants to go about applying deep learning from proof of concept all the way into production, and at the very end, a little bit of, of how we can, we can help you. So at Nirvana, and now at, at Intel, we have spent the last couple of years helping industries across very, uh, various vertical domains apply AI to transform their space, whether that's in the government, in health, in finance, and I'll walk through uh, some of what we've done um, uh, in, in, in the coming mo minutes. And particularly within AI, deep learning has driven a lot of these innovations from, for example, um, semantic segmentation from Facebook DeepMask or Google using deep learning to recently beat uh, the best human Go champion, and then Apple using deep learning to cut the error rate of Siri by, by about a half. I wanted to start by trying to understand what is deep learning and how is it conceptually different from classical machine learning that has come before it. So in classical machine learning, you would take an image of my boss here, Arjun, which is a n by n pixel space, and when you sort of use your domain knowledge of how faces are different from each other, such as distance between the eyes or distance between the eyes and the nose, to take that image and bring it down into a smaller set of features. You would then apply any of your classical uh, machine learning algorithms to take that set of features and then understand that this is Arjun. So important here is the feature engineering part, where you use your domain knowledge of how faces are different from each other to convert this very high dimensional image into a small set of, of understandable features. But sometimes the features are difficult to understand uh, to, or to come up with if you don't have the necessary domain knowledge, or they may be difficult to compute. And so in that way, deep learning is end-to-end, -end, in that you send in the raw image directly to a large neural network, sometimes on the order of tens of millions of parameters, and given enough data, it will find the informative features itself. So this is really a conceptual shift in thinking from how do I engineer the best features to how do I guide the model towards finding the best features itself, given enough data. But many of the old practices apply from traditional machine learning and, and data science, cleaning, exploration, annotation, hyperparameters. But the power, I think, with deep learning is this generality, that because it is end-to-end, -end, you can string a number of input-output relationships, whether that's in video, in speech, in natural language processing, uh, for autonomous driving scenarios, where you want to be able to find all the pedestrians and, 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 the, and the cars. And here are just sort of a few of the uh, examples that we've done in taking models, uh, building those algorithms, and then also bringing them into production. So for oil and gas, for example, uh, we build uh, computer vision algorithms to predict the location of fault lines, shown here in green, um, from the seismic reflection data shown here in purple. For some of our federal customers, we've built algorithms to detect buildings and other objects of interest in satellite imagery. In a variety of agriculture, uh, a variety of applications from agriculture, where we've worked to build computer vision algorithms that sit in on the edge on robots to detect um, contact points between the corn stalk and the ground, to command and control in, in cars, uh, to in oil and gas here, um, an application in underwater robotics uh, to detect and classify corrosion levels in underwater pipelines. This is sort of automated infrastructure inspection. Um, and even in sports, where applications and pose estimation, so that's sort of putting a stick figure um, around a person, uh, can enable you to better understand the mechanics in which sports players um, uh, con conduct their, their games. And maybe of relevance uh, recently is the work that we've done with the National Energy Research and Scientific Computing Center in the United States, where they have these large-scale weather simulations. And these simulations are so complex that they need additional post-processing to understand it. So we've built computer vision algorithms to be able to take the output of the simulation, shown here on the left, uh, and then localize and classify uh, the location of hurricanes uh, inside this large weather simulation. 
to allow them to be able to track the morphology of these hurricanes as they evolve uh, over the course of their, of their lifetime. And what's remarkable is that many of the applications that I just listed above come from the same model being applied to different data. So in all of these use cases here, from um, uh, self-driving cars to oil and gas to localizing hurricanes, we're using the same semantic segmentation model because the underlying task is the same regardless of the use case. And the task here is coloring each pixel, categorizing each pixel. Uh, in, in the autonomous driving case, it's whether it's a car or a road or, 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 or a tree. Um, in the fault line case, it's the probability of a particular pixel being a fault line. And so what's remarkable about deep learning is that all of these different applications are bundled up uh, and can be applied using the same model itself. So I think one thing we've learned a lot when coming up with these use cases is to be a little bit creative about where and how you can apply these models. Similarly, many of the use cases below here involve the same task, putting bounding boxes around objects. Now this can be a variety of modalities. This can be sort of underwater, satellite and aerial imagery, uh, local imagery that's coming from a remote sensor um, on a car. Um, in all of these cases, the same model being applied to different, different data. And so often when we start thinking about applications, our focus is really on what are the underlying tasks and not necessarily the domain in which it exists. A great example of this is um, of sort of the domain knowledge not mattering as much is Baidu, who recently built a state-of-the-art uh, Mandarin trans, uh, transcriptions uh, uh, model. Um, and the Baidu Innovation Lab built this model, even though half of the engineers there didn't actually understand the language itself. It's really the understanding this, this, the skill of being able to teach the model to find the right features given the data. And it's quite generalizable across multiple domains without needing expert domain knowledge. In the oil and gas case, we don't have any oil and gas experts. Um, we don't have uh, many experts in, in finance and time series. Um, but because we know very well how to put that model on the right glide path towards convergence, um, we can do a very good job in solving many of these problems. One of the key questions that many scientists or engineers or practitioners deal with is model selection. Given a particular problem, here, say, putting bounding boxes around cars, what is the right model to use? And there are many out there in the literature. Faster RCNN, single shot detection, uh, regional fully convolutional networks. And it's sort of difficult to navigate that space and understand what is the right model to select. I think what we've learned is that the instinct for many of our customers is to always go for the latest model in the literature. You know, if, if it was published a week ago, it must be the sort of best performing model that's out there. Um, but when you're moving things from pilot phase to production, there are so many trade-offs to consider. So this is a great paper from our colleagues at Google, where what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the performance, and on the x-axis is the, is, the, is the inference time, so the speed. And you can see there's this speed accuracy trade-off. And where, what kind of model you want to choose depends very importantly on your end application. If this is something that's being deployed on an edge underwater robot, um, that's very power and compute constraint, you'll make a very different decision than you're for operating at the data center and crunching through these images on a daily basis with large amounts of compute and not as much worry about, about latency. Even more so, it's not just the overall performance metric. I think one of the critical items here is that all these models were developed for academic use cases. And so this, this uh, accuracy performance was measured on Pascal VOC, which is a public data set. Um, but which model you select may also depend on the subcategories and more fine-grained distinctions within that performance. So for example, um, if you're trying to do pedestrian detection, uh, you may want to focus particularly on performance of small objects and not large objects. And as you can see on the right here, these are showing two different models where one, even though maybe its overall performance may be better than the other one, the other SSD model uh, performs much better, oh, sorry, the, the other model, faster standard, performs much better at small objects. And so you may need to make that more fine-grained distinction rather than just relying on this very generic measure that was designed not on your particular application, but sort of a generic object detection data set. The other important component is sort of understanding where your models are coming from. As I had mentioned, this object detection model designed to put bounding boxes around objects 
was designed and optimized for an academic data set. And an example image is shown here at the bottom here uh, with the uh, TV monitor. And you can see that if you're trying to take this same model and apply it to a completely different data set, such as satellite imagery in our case, the underlying statistics are very different. You have sort of a few objects per image to hundreds of objects. You have things like rotated boxes uh, because you have rotational symmetry in satellite data. You have multispectral data that you have to deal with. And so often what we have to do is understand where the model came from. You know, I was a grad student before too. I came out a model, I published it, I pushed it onto GitHub, and then I, I walked away to the next project. Um, but if you're trying to move these things into production, there's a lot you have to understand about where the model came from, and then appropriately making adaptations to your particular problem set. So for example, here we are exploring modifications to the topology to be able to, for example, predict uh, rotated bounding boxes or handle uh, the hyperspectral imagery that we observe in this kind of data sets. Now, I think a lot has been said in the last couple of years of sort of the coming flood of data, if it's not here already, from hospitals, from self-driving cars, from connected planes. I think what they mostly leave out is that this massive flood of data has to be funneled through this very, very tiny pipeline of manual annotations, where we have humans that are going through and putting boxes around cars, putting boxes around possible tumors, for in order for the model to learn the pattern of human behavior. So even though we work a lot with Fortune 100, Fortune 50, Fortune 500 companies, massive companies with large amounts of data, oftentimes their manual annotated data is very small. And we have to start very much small in our data acquisition process. And so how do you deal with this world where you have lots of data, but you have very little annotated data? One important understanding is that Deep learning, different from traditional machine learning before, scales a lot better the more data that you have. So this is from Baidu's speech recognition system and data showing performance as a function of the amount of hours of audio it was trained on. And you can see with only 100 hours of audio, the model is not outperforming traditional ASR systems because you're not, you don't have that domain knowledge that are injecting directly into the model. You need a ton of data for it to learn that domain knowledge. But as you start getting to 1,000 or 10,000 hours of audio, that's when you really start to meet and then surpass human level performance. And part of that is the reason why these massive data sets have emerged in the academic literature. And I think particularly for enterprises that are st first starting off in pilot projects, they may invest in annotating 1,000 images of, of, of data, apply an algorithm to it, and find that it doesn't surpass traditional systems and then sort of walk away um, knowing, you know, with, with the understanding that this hypothesis has been proven false. But I think instead the understanding here is that you have to invest very strongly in data, even for early POCs, to, uh, to be able to reap the rewards. And for the data science that are out there, how do you operate in a data limited world? And the answer here is to augment, augment, and augment your data. Uh, we've seen in many cases that data augmentation significantly outperforms any sort of innovation in the architecture or the topology that, that we come up with. And part of this comes from sort of applying the creativity in our data science. So for example, if you're doing emotion detection for an entertainment company, um, you may want to not just look at the image, but look at the transcript as well, or the speech as additional measures of data. Uh, if you're dealing with the vision world, there's a lot of sort of very traditional augmentations you can do, such as rotating, flipping, cropping. Uh, in natural language processing, what's, been, what's worked for us in the past is just doing, taking your sentences and doing thesaurus replacement in order to generate sort of new data from the data that you already have. And in speech, in your particular application, if you're building command and control system for cars, um, what you can do is overlay noise sources that you expect to see in a car. So a car going over gravel, uh, going over sand, going over um, asphalt. And so being able to augment your data and then also access hidden data sources that you may not expect to find, uh, such as uh, multimodal data sets for emotion detection, has for us been far more um, fruitful uh, than just sort of fixing your data set and then trying to do a lot of topology innovations and trying different architectures to get the best performance. Another important component here is being able to close the loop. 
So what I mean by that is in the autonomous driving case, for example, you develop an algorithm, you push it out onto the edge, uh, and then you want to be able to uh, take the data that's now being collected in real time, push it back up to the cloud, uh, and then be able to sort of retrain the network, detect anomalies, monitor your algorithm that sits out in production, and then be eventually push out um, a model again. And so closing the loop is very important in sort of developing a data acquisition strategy. Usually when I'm asked to evaluate startups, my first question is, how much data do you have and where did you get it from and how are you going to get more of it? Because that is really sort of the key to the unlocking these sort of deep learning algorithms. So closing the loop, being able to annotate on the edge, uh, in this case with Google Translate, you see a very nice suggest and edit button. That's a great way to get free human annotations. And then monitoring the algorithm in production is also uh, extremely important. Sort of the, the, the last couple of bits of advice here is that we've learned in production that deep learning is just part of a much larger system. In fact, unfortunately for algorithm engineers like myself, a small part of deep learning deployment is actually deep learning. A lot of time is spent on engineering sort of data ingest and transformation, scaling out the analytics and the inference, individual components, instrumenting these models to measure its performance over time to make sure there aren't any regressions or if the distribution of objects are, are changing um, uh, underneath us, um, simulating and validating models before you push it back out to the edge, again, after it's been updated, all of these different components. Um, in many cases, pay a more important part in deployment uh, than just sort of the deep learning algorithm itself that, that I've developed. And a great example of this is, is in autonomous driving, where um, you have autonomous vehicles uh, where you want to be able to take that data that's been collected, push it back up through networking to a data center, retrain the model, and then push it back out again. So closing this loop with a full stack solution from memory to networking to compute to the algorithms. So the sort of uh, model weights that I build um, are a very small part of plugging into this entire um, stack. And I think that's where sort of we've worked very fruitfully with many enterprise companies and sort of integrating the sort of large scale portfolio from hardware, libraries, frameworks, platforms, all the way up to applications. Um, knowing that these deep learning production systems incorporate all these different components together um, it's not just sort of one chip or, or one algorithm that, that, that sits out there. And that's what we've been doing, um, and that's what we believe at, at Nirvana and now at Intel is a sort of full stack approach. From the custom silicon we're building, up to framework animations, to building these systems at scale, uh, to finally deliver end-to-end -end solutions uh, for uh, many of our enterprise customers. The last thing that I wanted to highlight is we spent a lot of time the last six months to a year in speeding up performance of deep learning models on CPUs, particularly for inference. And we've done that by integrating math, the Intel math kernel library into many of these common frameworks, such as Neon, MXNet, CAFE, TensorFlow. And here you can see some of the speed ups from our work. So if you take a naive out of the box model, I'm uh, oh, sorry, out of the box um, uh, package like, uh, um, like TensorFlow, or sorry, in this case, MXNet, um, and you measure its performance in terms of images per second on image classification networks, such as AlexNet, uh, you will see that if you, if you enable the math kernel library, you get about 100x speed up. So going from about 6.1 images per second to 680 images per second. So I highly encourage folks that are out there that are trying to do inference or training on Xeons to make sure to enable the math kernel library. A lot of these changes are already upstream to like the master branch of TensorFlow so they're easily accessible. Um, or here through the AWS Deep Learning AMI, allows to e easily launch systems uh, that already have the math kernel library enabled to, for you to be able to sort of realize these type of speed ups. And so this is just sort of some images per second numbers from uh, our latest sort of Xeon Platinum processor. So you can see sort of across different frameworks, CAFE, TensorFlow, MXNet, Neon, across different topologies, we have sort of uh, able to reach sort of hundreds of images per second for models like ResNet 50 and VGG, and up to thousands of images for older and less compute intensive models uh, such as AlexNet. So that's really all I had were sort of 10 tips for building um, AI for enterprise. From understanding the model itself, and that's the same model, has multiple applications, 
to knowing where your model came from to understand its relevance for your particular problem set, to investing in data, augmentation, and then finally sort of monitoring in production. And then of course, if you can, use sort of Intel Nirvana technology. Uh, and of course, if you're, if you're uh, using sort of deep learning inference or training on Xeons, either on the cloud or on your local servers, uh, please, please be sure to enable the math kernel library uh, to accelerate your, tr your, uh, your work um, by you know, 80 to, to 100x. So I had a couple legal notices and configuration details. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your time.